Good afternoon, and welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa. Today, we will be joined by Veronica Pena from Ladder Up, who will talk to us about preparing your FAFSA for college. So without further ado, Veronica, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Of course, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, hello and welcome everyone. So if you have not heard about Ladder Up, then this is great. We'll go ahead and kind of review all of our services as well. At the end, we'll talk a little bit about the upcoming changes going on with FAFSA, um, but we'll go ahead and just jump right in. So uh, we can go ahead and move on to that next slide. Perfect. So Ladder Up uh, has three main programs, the first one being tax assistance, the second one, the tax clinic program, and then the last one is the financial literacy program. So let's go ahead and dive in onto that first one a little bit. What the tax assistance program means is uh, essentially we are here to go ahead and do taxes. So uh, we do have an eligibility requirement. It is all free. Um, as long as individuals and families right now are making under 60000 then we can go ahead and help them go ahead and file their taxes completely free. The other nice thing about that program is that we also do ITIN applications. We do renewals as well as that first application. They go hand in hand with tax returns. Um, so that is something that we kind of group up into that first program. It is our largest program and the most beneficial for most clients. The next one that we have is the tax clinic program. That one is a little bit more to do with controversies with the IRS as well as the um, IDOR. So that would be the Illinois Department of Revenue. So say, for example, if you do receive a letter, then they're able to help you. Um, any identity theft, spouse, spouse, uh, innocent spouse relief, and some more stuff that goes on in that one. We can go ahead and dive in a little bit in the next slide. Um, while I still have to hit that last one, so financial literacy program. That one is also our most um, best program for like outreach, getting in touch with adults as well as students. What we do is we have two separate uh, kind of legs of the program, the first one being the college success track. So for that one, we do a lot of workshops uh, some of them can be FAFSA workshops, financial aid, understanding student loans, understanding award letters, and then also managing your college finances. And then that second leg would be the adult literacy track. So for that one, um, geared also to adults, young adults, and then older adults, obviously, we help with budgeting, banking, and saving uh, credit building workshops, and then we do some consultings for one-on-one -on -one advice. If we go ahead and move on to the next slide, I can go ahead and dive into the tax assistance program. So for this one, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about it. Um, we essentially have this program where we bring in a bunch of volunteers. They're the ones who actually we teach how to do a tax return. From start to finish, there is a four set process. They come into our locations, they're all walk in. Um, they do run between January until the end of tax season, so about April. And then we do also have a summer session. So that actually is what's going on right now. Say if you've already filed your taxes and you need to make a change or you missed um, a form, then that would be called an amendment. An amendment is something that we filed during the summertime. The only location we do that is at the Harold Washington Library. Um, but for next year, say if you are trying to get your taxes done, you're more than welcome to visit one of our 12 locations, I believe there's gonna be for next year. Um, we have them basically everywhere in the like Chicagoland area and we're planning on expanding further. Um, so the best thing about that is that it's completely free. I love to say that. <laughs> and then the other thing too, is that we walk clients through the whole tax return. What that means is that if you go to another uh, company or someone that you have to pay for, what they usually do is they follow your tax return and they don't explain much. Well, we're there so that we can teach you what it is that you're getting. We want you to understand this tax return. Um, and that's kind of like the whole aspect of Ladder Up. We want to empower people with the knowledge that they need in order to 
get just basic things done, such as your tax returns, budgeting, everything like that. Um, and then we can go ahead and move on to that next slide. <clears throat> so this slide here tells you about our summer sessions. Like I said, it is at the Harold Washington Library. Um, we're located on the seventh floor there. That is also one of our tax sites in the tax season between January until April. And if you see in the summertime, we only have um, these this location open on Wednesdays with the dates on the left-hand side. And then usually the big question is, what do I need to bring? And that's beautiful. We love to answer that question. The biggest one is we need your original social security card. So we can't have any copies. We can't have a picture on your phone. We need the original. Since we are a VITA um, site, what that means is that the IRS allows us to do these tax returns for free through volunteers. And they also need a lot of documentation saying that this is the right person, um, that they have their original documents and everything like that. The next thing that we'll need is a valid form of a photo ID for yourself and your spouse if applicable. Then we also will need all of your tax documents. So say if you work a normal job um, and they give you either a W-2 or a 1099, we would need both of those. Um, any bank account numbers, uh, the account and the routing number, if you want a direct deposit for amendments, sometimes it is just a mailed in check, or if you owe money, we would give you a voucher where you can go ahead and mail that in. The next one is the verification of health insurance. So we understand that there are different types of health insurance, but the one that's needed the most on the tax return is the marketplace form that would actually come in the form of 1095A. So that one um, will come at the end of the year. If not, you're able to go ahead and download that through your website that you get your health insurance from. Um, this one is very specific. If you don't have that, it would cause some delays. So we always push to make sure that if you do have health insurance through the marketplace, that you're also bringing that form along. Um, and then say if you wanna go ahead and do an amendment during the summer session. So like I said, an amendment would just be a change in your already filed tax return. Then we would need that initial tax return that you did file. Um, we wanna see what it was that they did if you didn't file it with us so that we can end up changing and making um, the correction that you need on the amendment. And then the other thing too is a lot of people have tried to do Uber, Lyft, any like um, food deliveries, and they usually issue what's called a 1099. Um, they do issue a 1099K, sometimes it's a 1099 miscellaneous. These are all forms that require you to file your taxes. Um, anything that has a 1099 is considered a self-employment, even though you're being employed through Uber or say Lyft. When we get that information, um, Uber or Lyft will also provide the mileage, anything else like expenses, any tolls and fees. That's all information that you're going to need. And then obviously, if, for example, you have um, your own company and you're you're only getting paid in cash incomes or by checks or like Venmo, then that would be another conversation. That would also be a self-employment, but we would need to make sure that we have all of your documentation. So say if you're buying, um, to say for example, if you are cleaning houses, right? You would need to bring um, the amount that you're expensing on it. <clears throat> so for example, if you had to buy a new vacuum for the job, or if you needed to buy any cleaning supplies, those are all expenses that we need to see um, to go ahead and put that into the tax return. If you're traveling between jobs, so this one is a little tricky for some people to understand, but we do like um, a blog book where you kind of write down all of your information where you're traveling to, um, when it is that you go back and forth from jobs. So the way I like to explain this is that the first and the last drive to work and the drive back home do not count, but everything in between does. So say if you are scheduled to clean three different houses, then the first drive to that job doesn't count, but then the drive from that house to the second and the third house do count. So that is something we always like to to tell people so that they take advantage of those um, opportunities of claiming the transportation miles. 
<clears throat> so like I said, if you did need to file uh, an amendment, we need to see the original tax return. And that's something that we always uh, require. And if you don't have it, we do have you kind of go back and try to get it so that you can have the best outcome possible. And then we can go ahead and move on to that next slide. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. <clears throat> so our next program, this one um, is actually ran by, by our colleague, Karina. She is what's considered a CAA agent. So that's a certified acceptance agent. What that means is when a client does need to get their ITIN uh, renewed or it's their first time applying for the ITIN, then they are able to um, come set up an appointment with Karina and then she's able to go ahead and look at all of your documents, make sure that <clears throat> you bring your original passport that has the date of entry, um, any IDs, any documents for the children. And then, so if you didn't have a CAA, you would have to mail all of that in. Sometimes it takes months for you to get that information back or it could even get lost in the mail. The nice thing is that since she has a CAA, then we're able to verify that all that information you showed us is correct and that it's real. <clears throat> and because of that, we're able to go ahead and give you your documents back and just submit the application. We just have to make sure that we sign and say, yes, we verified that all of these documents are original documents um, and that the person who is claiming to get this item is also here. I can also backtrack a little bit for people who don't know what an ITIN is. Um, it is the process. So for example, I know this is a little unsaid, but if you don't have a social security number and you're still working and you get a W-2 or a 1099, you are still required to file taxes. So in order to file taxes, you do have to apply for what's called an ITIN. So that's an individual taxpayer identification number. Um, once you have that, then the IRS is able to pinpoint, okay, this person worked at this company and paid this many, this much money in taxes. From there, if you overpaid in taxes, then you would be able to get a tax refund, or if you owe money, you would be able to go ahead and pay. So the benefit of this is just the fact of being able to file taxes. Some people may get a little confused. Oh, so if I don't have a social security number, can I go ahead and apply for an I-10 so I can work? The answer to that is no, an I-10 is simply for taxes. So the reason for that is so that in case you ever want to apply for a residency, it also shows that you are in good standing with the IRS, that you pay taxes, you work, you're part of this economy and that's something that they love to see. So that's why we always push people to get ITINs, um, specifically when they have to file taxes. This is just the way that we have to do it. And then we can go ahead and move on to that next slide. All right, so this one is a fun one. And I say that kind of funny because it's the tax clinic. So a lot of the times when people receive letters from the IRS, it can be very scary and daunting. And we're actually here to go ahead and sit with you and understand why you're receiving this letter, trying to explain it to you, what it means, and what the next steps are. So we do have um, a pro bono attorney as well as a, an attorney and a paralegal who work in the tax clinic. They take on a ton of different cases. Some of the common cases could be collections. So say, for example, you filed your taxes and now you owe the IRS money. We're able to help um, either set up an offer and compromise where we can say, hey, we know that this client owes this much money, but this is as much as they're able to pay. So we kind of negotiate between that based off of what you have, what you're making, and the rest of your income that you have. And then we do have cases where they could be audits as well as um, we can represent you guys in tax court. So what that would look like is that if a you receive a letter, if the client receives a letter from the IRS saying, hey, we don't know... Um, where you're getting this money from, we'd like to see more information, right? And the IRS does not put it that cleanly. They make they make it very complicated sometimes to understand these letters. 
Um, so we're there, we can sit down, we can figure out like, oh, is this a case where you forgot to submit a W-2? All we have to do is submit that W-2, respond to that audit, or we can also say, hey, this money was actually made from my self-employment job, and then you would have to provide some documentation, proving your expenses, things like that. <clears throat> so we help you as, as well with that. Say, for example, you need to go to tax court. We also help with that. We go in your place. Um, we represent you there. And then it really relieves that, like, that level of stress of having to go find a lawyer and understand what it is that you need to bring and everything else. So we love to make things simple. And that's one of the ways that we can try to do that. The next one they, they do help with, oh, yeah, there we go, um, is the identity theft. So a lot of cases can be from where you, at least a lot of cases that you kind of find out that you're a victim of identity theft could be when you're filing for FAFSA. So something that happens a lot is when you end up filing for FAFSA, there could be um, a thing that you end up getting back and the the financial aid office says, hey, it looks like we're going to need to go through verification with you. Verification is just a way of them verifying that all of the information you put in is correct and they're matching it up with what they have in the system for um, your parents or yourself if you're an independent on the FAFSA application. Sometimes it could be that they ended up seeing that you were a victim of identity theft and now they need more information about you, right? So the tax clinic does help with that. Um, they also walk you through what to do with your, with your, with your financial aid office, how to explain it to them, showing them documentation, things like that. And then the last thing that they also help with is the innocent spouse relief. So this happens in the case where the taxpayer who was, there could be a taxpayer who was coerced into signing a return or did not agree to file a return with a potentially abusive spouse um, and this we also help with it's all it's usually a very delicate topic and we have the people who are here to help we want to help and we just make sure that we walk through this together so that you don't feel alone and then we can go ahead and move on to that next slide <clears throat> perfect so we already hit on the tax assistance program that's our biggest one. We already hit on our tax clinic with the attorneys and they help you with the controversies. And then finally, this is the financial literacy program. So a little bit of what we're doing here today falls into this category. The first one um, is the college success track. What that means is that we are here to also help students get through FAFSA, get through college, understand their awards, their loans, um, making sure that they can figure out how to best manage all of their resources without leaving um, college, or sorry, with leaving college without any debt, right? So that's the dream, and we love to try to push students to apply for scholarships. Um, we see if they receive loans, and we tell them what are their potential benefits as well as their um, cons that they could have from the loans. And then of course, the other leg to that program is the adult literacy check. So for that one, <clears throat> I really like this one. I feel like my family, for example, really needed a lot of these programs. They had a hard time understanding how to budget um, and being a part of Ladder Up, you really learn how to learn, you, sorry, you really learn how to budget as well as banking and saving. We help, um, if you have like low credit, we help you understand how to keep increasing your credit. That's usually for clients who say, you're finally ready to buy a house, then let's see how we can go ahead and increase your budget. I mean, your your credit, sorry. And then the, the other one that we like to talk about, this one I love to say is both college success track as well as adult literacy, is the onboarding for employees. So when you do apply for that new job or if you're a part of the student population who is um, doing a work study, they usually give you a form at the beginning that's, okay, how many withholdings would you like to save? And a lot of these people don't understand that. So we're actually here to help you, help you fill out that form correctly so that you don't owe any money at the end. 
a lot of the times when you file your taxes and there is um, a debt that you have to pay back to the IRS, it could be because of your onboarding paperwork. Usually that W-4 is where you write down how many, ex how many exemptions you have, as well as how many withholdings you have. Um, for that, that is a whole different workshop and we also like to help with that. And obviously we do the understanding of your taxes. We love that one so that people understand what it is that they're getting, any credits that they potentially can um, receive and then say if you filed your taxes, this just happened last week. We were helping a client who she had to file her taxes for 2022. She was a little late, so we were kind of helping her with that. And she had qualified for a medical waiver that she didn't know about. She ended up coming back the following, or she's coming back this week now so that she can go ahead and redo the last four years where she didn't claim that waiver. So something like that is really important. It goes from, it goes very different if you claim it versus if you don't, right? So we we like to tell you guys, hey, make sure that you're understanding what it is that you're claiming. Make sure that you tell the tax preparer everything about your situation. So the last one as well is about consulting to build financial capability. This one is a lot to do with like a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing where we go with uh, clients, we sit down with them, we ask them, all right, tell us about your situation, what it is that your five-year goals are, what is your 10-year goal, um, trying to understand what it is they want to save for, and just like even if they have debt, how they can plan to reduce their debt within a certain time frame. And then we can go ahead and move on to that next line. <clears throat> All right. So the biggest question here is FAFSA, right? So if you're a parent and your student is about to graduate high school, you want to start figuring out about FAFSA. You want to start maybe even your freshman year understanding what it is that the parents are going to need, what it is your student is going to need. Um, and this year it is changing, right? So if you haven't filed for FAFSA yet, you would have to get it done by June 30th, 2023. So again, for the school year of 2022 to 2023, if you still have not filed, you have until the end of this month to file. Um, and then of course, if we move on to that next slide, <clears throat> I do want to hit on this is that for next year, so for the school year of 2024 to 2025, Right, so if you have a student in high school right now who just left and is going into their senior year, then that student is going to have to um, try to keep up with this news. So the FAFSA application is changing. What's going on is that it, they're trying to reduce it um, question-wise to make it a little bit more simple. So students will have will have gone from 100 and I think 36 questions on the application to now I believe 36 questions. Um, they still haven't released the application or what it looks like. They've just kind of been releasing information week by week. Uh, since we are still in the summertime, I believe they should offer more information in this fall that's coming. So what that means is that you need to understand that you have to keep up with this um, if you're a parent, I would suggest reaching out to your student, your student's um, financial advisor or even their counselors to see how it is that you can support them now. On my end, the best way that you can support your children is by making sure that your taxes are done correctly, making sure that you have that documentation. Um, you would want to make sure that if your children don't have an FSA ID, that you're creating that, you're holding onto the password as well as the username um, so that you can apply for FAFSA once it opens in December. <clears throat> That's another change too. Since they are creating this new application, uh, they're actually opening the application a little late this year in December. I think it's December 1st that will be the opening of this application. And then for next, for, well, at least for this year, it, the, they opened up the application last year on October 1st, um, and they plan to go back to that, but because of these changes, they had to push it a little bit. So just make sure that you also um, understand what kind of information 
the FASTMA application is asking. From what we've heard so far, they will want information from both parents. So say if the child only lives with mom, it sounds like they also want to know what the situation is with dad. So these are all things that are in the works. There's nothing that has been set in stone yet um, or that they've released to us. So that is something that I would suggest reaching back out in the fall and making sure that you have that information set. Something too that they have been saying a lot is that they want consent from both parents. So say if your student uh, is your dependent, so say mom has her daughter on her tax return as a dependent, then mom has to give FAFSA the consent to retrieve the IRS um, tax return from them and be able to share it with FAFSA. So for this year, consent from both parents will be very big. If you can start that conversation with your, um, with the daughter's parents or your children's parents, you can try to make that a little bit easier by starting the conversation now. Um, and then I think the other information that they gave was just reducing the questions. They want to make it really simple before it was a really lengthy application. Um, they would ask you a lot of questions where it like would make students a lot more confused than they should be. And this year they want to reduce that. I know that they removed the question about selective service. Um, and then there's a few other questions that they have said that they removed. But as of right now, um, they still haven't released the application. So we always push you to go ahead and visit the FAFSA um, website and see what it is that you can do now to prepare for later. Can we go ahead and move on to that next slide? Thank you for that. Um, and then this is just kind of what I was able to find on their website. So for FAFSA 2024 to 2025, this is a little bit of a roadmap um, for where they plan to be within the year. Um, and then kind of like when they might release the application, when you can see a preview of it, things like that, <clears throat> as well as like any tools that they can use. Um, the other thing too is that I believe they are changing um, the cost. No, it's the estimated family contribution. So that used to be the amount that you were able to see on the end of the application. Um, if you were at a zero, it was most likely that they assumed that you were not able to afford school. So they usually tried to offer you more scholarships, more grants, um, as well as loans. And then this year, I believe they're changing it to student aid index, which has a bunch of different factors. Um, so that is something that I push everyone to go ahead and take a look at so that they can further understand these new terms. And hopefully we can also have another of these presentations once all that information is released so we can make your life a little bit easier. Um, and then of course, if say you are at the point of filing for FAFSA, we here at Ladder Up help any student with their families file it. We can go ahead and have you make an appointment, sit down in the office, and we can kind of walk you through that whole application, um, helping you understand what these questions mean, making sure that you feel confident when you submit it. And then we can go ahead and move on to that next slide. <clears throat> so I do just wanna say thank you to everyone. Um, and I'll kind of open it up for questions. If anyone does have any, I am more than happy to answer them. So I do see a question in the chat. Uh, it's in Spanish and I do read Spanish so I can try to translate it for you guys. Um, so Maria has a question. She says, what happens when you are a resident of Chicago and you decide to study in Michigan? And she's asking if you could still apply for FAFSA. So yes. So say once you apply for FAFSA, um, on that application, it will prompt you to submit what schools it is that you are applying to or the school that your child has decided to go to. So what happens is that they then put you down, say, if you're going to Michigan State, right? Your child is going to Michigan State, and after that, 
you file out you fill out the FAFSA form, you select Michigan State, and what happens there is that FAFSA then shares your information with that school. Um, with the consent of the parents and the student, they're able to go ahead and share that information so that then Michigan State can give your child um, another financial award letter. So that's essentially where it's going to. Your child is filing FAFSA so that they can see what potential grants and scholarships they get. The only difference is that there are a few different grants for Illinois residents than there is for Michigan. Once she does go to Michigan, she could be charged that out-of-state um, tuition, which is usually higher than the in-state tuition. Um, but then sometimes they have um, grants or scholarships for people who are from out-of-state. They also give you options for loans. Um, y ahorita lo digo en español. I'll go ahead and just translate it in Spanish. <clears throat> So, me dio la pregunta que si su hija vive en Chicago um, y va a ir al colegio en Michigan, entonces puede ser la forma de FAFSA. La pregunta o la, respu la respuesta de eso es, es sí, ella puede todavía hacer la aplicación de FAFSA porque es la aplicación que le da la información a la escuela de cuánto es que deben de pagar ustedes. So, el FAFSA le puede dar Um, unos, unas, un, ¿cómo se dice? Un paquete de finanzas que ellos piensan que deben de pagar, ¿verdad? O so, si le dicen a la escuela que va a ir su, su hijo, es, um, vamos a decir que le cuesta como 15 mil dólares. Y la aplicación dice que no debe de pagar nada. Entonces, la escuela de Michigan van a ver qué pueden hacer ellos para ayudar el estudiante y la familia para pagar por la escuela. All right, and then is there any other questions? All right, Veronica, it looks like we don't have any other questions. So we want to thank you for joining us today on Money Monday and for providing this valuable information on the FAFSA process, as well as the upcoming changes. Please be sure to reach out to Ladder Rep if you need assistance in preparation of your FAFSA forms as the school year is coming up. And it's never too early to get started. So parents of juniors and seniors, this is absolutely something that you can get started with now. And again, be on the lookout for those changes that are coming down sometime this summer of the new FAFSA process. So again, we want to thank Veronica. We want to thank Ladder Up for always being a value partner and always agreeing to assist us when it comes to sharing information with our city residents. We also ask that you stay updated with our upcoming events and our next Money Mondays, so you're going to go to www.chicagocitytreasurer.com and you will see what we have going on and what we have coming up. And so last but not least, we want to thank Veronica again for joining us this afternoon. Thank yes. everyone for attending <laughs> and stay in tune with us and also stay in tune with Ladder Up. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Money Mondays with Melissa. We hope you enjoyed today's session and found value in the topic of discussion. Follow Chicago City Treasurer on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn to stay on top of all upcoming events. Remember, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Chicago Treasurer's Office at 312-744-3356 or visit www.chicagocitytreasurer.com. We'll see you next time for Money Mondays with Melissa.